I, I gave you I gave you hope. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay. okay. Uh, just uh, one announcement before we get started regarding the biostat. Uh, seminars. We will not be having a biostat seminar next week. Uh, it's spring break for the students, um, but we will be picking up the the following week. Um, and so that's the only announcement. Uh, so with that, Lindsay. Sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Kelly Kidwell here today um, from the Department of Biostatistics at University of Michigan where she is an associate professor of biostatistics and associate chair of biostatistics academic affairs. Um, I first met Dr. Kidwell through the Vail uh, workshop series, either as students or as now faculty, something like that. Um, and I've heard her give many talks elsewhere and, and thought she'd be a great uh, visitor for us uh, today. And she will be speaking about smart designs for treatment effectiveness in small samples. Thank you for joining us. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I am gonna give a really high level overview of the work I've been working on for the past five or six years. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just speak up and ask them as I go, or feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'd prefer to answer them for clarity as we go instead of like holding them on all till the end. So just feel free to speak up. Um, I must acknowledge that this is not just work for myself, but from a really great team of talented players here. Um, I work a lot with my colleague, Tom Braun here at University of Michigan. Um, he has primarily done phase one uh, clinical trial design and analysis, but um, I've sort of roped him in and working on these small sample designs. Um, we've connected with Roy Tamira, who had a long career at Eli Lilly and is now at USF and a part of the Rare Disease Research Consortium, and has really had a lot of um, the uh, motivating applications for our methods that I'll be talking about. And then several of these are students, um, Boshin, Yan Chang, and Holly all graduated last year. Two went to industry and Holly went to Case Western. Um, Matt Skipper is another a faculty here who is working on methods with Holly and then my current PhD student who's likely graduating maybe even um, at the end of this year or next year and will be on the job market. So um, a lot of what I'm gonna what I'm gonna talk today is in this small sample space and we've been primarily motivated by rare diseases and in, in particular one rare disease but all of these methods are are pretty general um, they don't necessarily have to be in this in this isolated skin vasculitis, which we've um, used for motivation. So what are rare diseases? There are diseases that affect less than 200,000 individuals. Um, however, taken together, there are many rare diseases, about 7,000 rare diseases that collectively affect about 30 million Americans or one in 10. So while individually they're rare, collectively, it's quite a huge issue. And although the FDA um, supported the Orphan Drug Act in the 1980s to try to incentivize developing drugs in small samples. Um, only about 5% of rare diseases have approved treatments available. So there's a clear need here for more innovative design um, and analysis and, and work in this space. So rare disease research has primarily um, been done, if they're, if they're trying to run a trial, it's primarily either single arm, or if it is multi-arm, it's often non-randomized. So just based on the fact that there are a small number of individuals to enroll, recruit, quite difficult, um, about two-thirds of the designs are single arm or non-randomized, as opposed to one-thirds being multi-arm or, or including randomization. If there is, if there are multiple arms or there is randomization involved, then most commonly used designs include the crossover design. So a randomization to the sequence, first get A, wash out, get B, or first get B, wash out, get A, so that we get information on both drugs from every individual um, and can find the, can estimate the treatment efficacy to compare A versus B. Um, N of one designs are just crossover designs in one individual, and you can add on more periods. 
right? So you can do A, B, A, B, A, B, 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 A, um, et cetera, so that we can get more data from one individual. And then you can potentially um, collect multiple and of one trials and combine them via meta-analytic methods. Um, and then adaptive designs have been written about as a uh, what should be used in rare diseases. Um, however, scouring the literature, there's actually quite um, not a lot of, of real applications of adaptive design in rare diseases. So it, it happens to be present in the statistical literature and the disease literature, but not really present on clinicaltrials.gov or in clinical papers. So there's this real clear need for innovation in this area. You know, everybody lately has been consumed by big data, and there's a lot of questions that we have in that area with the um, with all the technology that we have and the data that we can get. However, we haven't mastered small data yet, right? So um, this is where I've really been sitting and thinking, um, and there have been people who have said, you know, we really need this innovation here, and the FDA has even recognized it. In 2018, they started this initiative, the Complex Innovative Trial Design Initiative, um, where they are trying to, again, incentivize or work together with um, groups on how they can use adaptive Bayesian or other novel statistical approaches to really get more effective treatments for rare diseases out there. So I'm going to focus on what we call the small n sequential multiple assignment randomized trial or SN smart design. And this is motivated, like I said, in this particular area, um, isolated skin vasculitis, but isolated skin vasculitis, but is really applicable to many rare diseases. What we were really looking for was a design and methods where we, we didn't want placebo. So in isolated skin vasculitis, there are multiple treatments already being used in practice. However, it wasn't clear which ones were, which one was most effective, um, but they're already used. So we didn't wanna, we didn't wanna include placebo. We don't wanna, often placebo is not included if it's possible in rare diseases because we don't wanna waste patients on a placebo arm. Um, we wanted to make sure that individuals were guaranteed to be on at least one drug. So again, not really including placebo here. Um, and then if they weren't responding to the drug, we wanted to allow individuals to receive something else. And then if they were responding to the drug, we wanted them to be able to stay on that drug. So right on a crossover trial, regardless of how the individual did on that first treatment, they have to go get that second treatment. They need to cross over. We want that second stage of, of data on that other treatment. However, if, they're, if the person's doing well on the treatment they first received, they might not adhere or drop out. Uh, if they have to switch. So we wanted to sort of, um, you know, allow for, for some um, not having to switch if they didn't want to from a crossover design and, and the design that we're going to propose. So this is a general SN smart design. Um, again, we have comparative effectiveness. So we're thinking of three active treatments. I'm just calling them A, B, and C here. We're going to randomize participants um, in a first stage across A, B, and C, it could be, you know, we'd likely think this would be equal randomization. Of course, there could be unequal randomization if um, that was what the investigators wanted. Then we'd look at, we'd allow this first stage to be the amount of time that we, we would see a treatment effect. So for example, in our isolated skin vasculitis trial, it's six months. We think that's the amount of time that it takes to see a treatment effect. We then measure response. I'm gonna to focus today mostly on binary outcomes. That's what it was in this trial that's motivated our method. So that's what we're using. Um, if the participant responded to their initial treatment, they stayed on that treatment for another six months. Um, and if they didn't respond to that treatment, then they were allowed, to, they were re-randomized to switch treatments. So if you didn't respond to A, you could switch, uh, be re-randomized to B versus C, et cetera. Um, now, if you're familiar with SMART designs, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, this looks like a SMART design, a sequential multiple assignment randomized trial. I'm gonna differentiate it from a SMART in a few slides. Um, I wanna show you, this is the actual trial that has really motivated our methods. Um, like I said, this is uh, the trial of three active treatments for isolated skin vasculitis with the acronym ARAMIS. Um, you can find it on clinicaltrials.gov by this number. 
It's currently accruing. The goal is to have 90 total participants across these three treatment arms. With the ultimate goal of um, estimating the treatment effect or the response rate for these three treatments, which I'll just call A, D, and C. So a SMART design or sequential multiple assignment randomized trial design is a multi-stage design, randomized design, where individuals are randomized to a set of treatment options and then maybe re-randomized at an interim time point in the trial. So essentially for a SMART design, you have to have sequential randomization, at least two randomizations in a sequence, which you can see we certainly have here. SMART designs really came about in the early 2000s. Um, I think of the godmother of smart designs as Susan Murphy, who used to be at Michigan, is now at Harvard. Um, there's quite a lot of work actually even before her seminal paper um, by Dawson and Labori um, and Peter Thaw as well, uh, among others. And they really proposed these smart designs, these multi-stage designs in this like kind of phase two space to develop these sequences of treatments. Um, and I'm not interested in those in this setting. Um, and so I'm really taking smart designs, we're taking smart designs and flipping them on their head. So everything you, if you know about smart designs or smart design methods, forget it, <laughs> erase your memory. Um, we're, we're not really thinking about those here. Um, the design is the same, but our goals and methods are gonna differ substantially. So, you know, kind of going back to elementary school thinking about this Venn diagram, comparing the SMART versus an SN SMART. While the design looks the same, an SN SMART is really using the two stages to get more data from a small number of individuals. We're really interested in estimating the first stage treatment effects. We're not interested in developing those dynamic treatment regimens or adaptive interventions or tailored sequences of treatments, um, which is generally the motivation of standard SMART designs. Um, standard SMART designs, because they're interested in those sequences of treatments, often require large sample sizes. However, we're in small samples, rare diseases, our sample sizes are gonna be less than 200, often less than 100, even you know, less than 50. Um, Re-randomization in our SN SMART design, we're gonna require um, for most of this that are for the first set of methods I'm gonna talk about that that re-randomization endpoint is the same as the overall endpoint. Um, in a standard SMART, they can differ. And this, we're really thinking about the outcome at the end of the first stage is the same as the outcome at the end of the second stage. And we're just combining those two stages of data to get more efficient first stage estimates. As you can see, right, there's clear connection between the SN SMART design and a crossover design as well. And, in fact, when I first started working on these methods, Susan Murphy was still at Michigan and I presented them to her and she really disliked that we were calling this an SN SMART, that we were using the term SMART. She said SMARTs are motivated by dynamic treatment regimens. That's what people think. You cannot use this term. And I said, but the design is the same. It would seem silly if we use something else. Um, so we argued a little bit and kind of, I think we compromise by adding this SN SMART, maybe not, she might still not be happy about it, but right, it's the same design, but we're, we're, we're interested in different things. And she said, well, why don't you call them ethical crossover designs, right? Because you're allowing those who respond to continue and only crossing over those who, who don't respond. But the thing is, right, by, term, by that terminology an ethical SMART design, our ethical crossover design, it's like all other crossover designs are unethical, which obviously isn't the case. So, um, you know, we, we decided on SN SMART and just to be very, very clear that the motivation and the methods are gonna differ between an SN SMART and a standard SMART. So in an SN SMART, it's like a crossover, but um, we'll really only let those uh, individuals who didn't respond receive that re-randomization to, to get a different treatment. Okay, so our goal here, as I've said already, is that we want to compare the first stage treatments by pooling the data across both stages to find the best um, one optimal treatment. I'm going to focus first on the outcome being binary, um, and this is the same outcome at the end of the first stage and second stage, so I'll just call it response. We're looking at the response rate. Um, and so our question of interest is, does treatment A or B or C have the best first stage response rate, or let's pretend that's six month response rate. 
Now I'm going to, we're going to work mostly in the land of Bayesian analysis. And this is often used in rare diseases um, because we can incorporate our historical knowledge, right? What we knew with the data that we actually observe um, to get these posterior distributions uh, for our treatment effect estimates. It's quite intuitive, the um, results that we get. And it also allows us to draw the emphasis away from our standard significance and p-values, which we know are gonna be quite difficult to achieve in a small sample, right? That 5% type one error um, and 80% power is just going to be very difficult uh, to, to uh, maintain with numbers that are less than 100 across three treatments. So we wanna focus on the estimates, we wanna focus on the credible intervals, um, and we want to also be able to incorporate this external evidence because we have such few individuals that can be in our trial. And often there's rich natural history or registry studies um, that exist that we can consider. So our Bayesian joint stage model is really quite simple. Um, the first stage outcome is Bernoulli, and our second stage outcome is going to be modeled conditionally on the first stage outcome. And we're going to connect these two stages um, or the response rates from the two stages by what we call linkage parameters. We're gonna use all the data from both stages in our estimation and in our inference, and we're gonna incorporate investigators' opinions or um, natural history or historical data um, about our response rates in our prior distributions. So I have very little math on these slides, to be honest, but this is, this is a tiny little bit of notation our primary interest is, is in this pi k, pi a, pi b, pi c are the response rates of the three treatments. Um, and then my uh, the second stage response rates are gonna be denote, denoted by these linkage parameters, beta naught and beta one times the first stage treatment. So beta naught k times pi k prime is the response rate for the second stage treatment k prime after someone didn't respond in the first, after there's no response in the first stage for treatment k. And then beta 1k pi k is going to be the first stage, or sorry, the second stage response rate um, for treatment k, given that they did respond to treatment k in the stage one. So our causal goal here is that we're trying to infer causation of the stage one outcome, considering both stages of data. We're really looking to estimate the average treatment effect. And so we're going to assume that the general causal assumptions of SUTVA, randomization of treatment, and exclusivity apply here, um, and those generally hold due to the randomization that we have in the trial. We have additional assumptions that I'll show you in our model um, that we can, we can be more flexible about. So here's a super simple, you know, this relatively simple model. We have our um, outcome, our first stage outcome is just Bernoulli with um, pi k for each treatment. And our second stage outcome is conditional on the first stage outcome and the first stage treatment received. And so we have our linkage parameters here and whether there is a response or no response. So we're gonna make these additional assumptions on this model that we don't have to make, but it is gonna help us constrain our estimation space and pick our prior distributions. And these were assumptions that we felt held in our motivating example of isolated skin vasculitis for the ARMS trial. These could definitely be uh, loosened. Uh, this model is more flexible. We don't require these assumptions that I'll show next, um, but it just helped in our setting. So as you can see, when I first introduced the linkage parameters, I had a beta not K or beta one K so that the linkage parameter could depend on the initial treatment. We're actually gonna assume um, in our case that there's just one linkage parameter for the non-responders and one linkage parameters for the responders. This is, a, is gonna lessen the amount of um, parameters that we're estimating, which is helpful in small samples. And we, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some sensitivity analyses on that. We're also um, going to sort of constrain the space in which we're estimating for these linkage parameters. We believed in um, the Aramis setting that the response rate in stage two for treatment K was gonna be lower than that response rate for that same treatment in, in stage one um, for the non-responders. So if there, if there wasn't a response, then on average, the second stage treatment 
um, estimate was going to be lower than it was in the first stage. And if there was a response, we thought that it likely be as good of a response, if not better, in the in the second stage for those who did respond. Now, this is again just helping to constrain the space of estimation for our linkage parameters. It's helping us. Um, it, it helps define the uh, prior distributions uh, settings for these parameters, but th these these assumptions do not have to be the case. We can certainly get away with them, um, do away with them, and allow uh, for different prior distributions. Then I'll show you next. So our prior distributions, again, these are disease and treatment specific, so they would change depending upon um, the setting. But for us, our Aramis investigators felt like an ineffective treatment would have a spontaneous re response rate of about 20%. So our prior distribution for um, our response rates was a beta distribution with the parameter with the um, hyper parameters of 0.4 and 1.6. And that has a very small, right, the, if you sum those together, it's the essentially prior effective sample size of our prior distribution. We're enrolling 90 participants. This is only two, so we're not putting a lot of weight um, on this prior, uh, the prior for the uh, response rate. Now, our prior for the linkage parameter for non-responders, um, we assumed a beta 1, 1 distribution, which is the same as, as a uniform 0, 1. So we're allowing that linkage parameter to range from 0 to 1. If you remember, we said it was going to be less than 1. If we cho chose a different, um, a different prior distribution, we could loosen that assumption. And this was also chosen because the Aramis investigators felt like, on average, the second stage response for non-responders was gonna be about half as large as it was for the first stage response rate. And then our linkage parameter for the responders, um, we again assumed that was gonna be greater than one, um, but we wanted to limit that distribution. So we chose a Pareto distribution, which has um, most of its mass between one and three, um, and just a little bit of mass past that. And so um, on average, the mean here is about one and a half and, um, we think that mostly the response rate will be quite similar um, in the second stage as it was for the first stage, maybe a little bit better for those who responded. Now we're gonna compare our Bayesian joint stage model to a frequentist joint stage model um, in case anybody's uncomfortable with um, going Bayesian. Um, and so we can show particularly the FDA if you know they're a little weary of this prior, of the choice of our priors, how subjective they are, et cetera. Um, well, we could we could use the frequentist method. So we have this joint stage GE model. We're going to use the log of the outcome as opposed to the logit because there's some convergence issues in small samples, um, and we'll just correct the variance using robust standard errors. So our um, first stage uh, treatment effect is here, right? We can see that there's a correspondence between the alphas and the pies, and then the second stage treatment effect is conditional again on the first stage treatment. Um, and the first stage response is given here. And so again, there's a correspondence between these gammas and the betas that I showed in the Bayesian joint stage model. Now, I'm not gonna go through all the results. This has been, um, this work has been published in Stats of Medicine back in 2018. I just wanted to show one visual of what we found. Um, this was in a scenario that wasn't like an ideal setting, um, but, uh, what we can see is that there's still pretty great results. So the green bars here, um, so I'm showing bias and root mean square error, which includes bias and the efficiency or variance um, of our treatment effect estimates. And we have them for the response rate of treatments A, B, and C on the bottom here. Um, and so let me make sure my mouse is working. Whoops. And so the green boxes um, are the bias or root mean square error for our Bayesian joint stage model. The blue boxes are for that frequentist version of the joint stage model. The yellow and the red are if you just use the first stage data, which would have been, which would be, you know, sort of more standard if you're thinking about, oh, they would have just done a three arm, a three arm like parallel randomized control trial, right? Um, a randomized trial amongst these active treatments. And so the yellow one is, well, it's, we're going to use Bayesian analysis and incorporate that prior information. And the red one is we'll just look at the first stage maximum likelihood estimate, right? We'll just look at the observed proportion of responders. And so what you can see is that 
across all of these methods, there's really quite small bias with the largest bias being in a first stage Bayesian um, analysis. The smallest bias probably being in the, um, the joint stage GE model or maybe the, the um, joint stage Bayesian model. What we can really see here is that there is this, this, this savings in efficiency um, for, from our, for our joint stage Bayesian model. So again, these in the RMSE, you want a, a smaller root mean square error showing that there's smaller uh, bias and variance. And so um, the green bars you can see are the smallest in all across all methods. Um, it's smaller than that um, frequentist joint stage model. And both of those are much smaller than if you only use the first stage data. So using this design, using two stages of data is gaining us efficiency in these treatment effect estimates, which, which is incredibly important in rare diseases and small samples. So we found that when our assumptions held, our Bayesian joint stage model was really great, right? Low bias, smallest root mean square error, um, shortest credible intervals and, and nominal coverage. Even when the assumptions were violated, the Bayesian joint stage model was quite robust. Um, when we added back in, when we allowed the um, linkage parameters to differ by the first stage treatment, we call that a Bayesian joint stage multiple linkage parameter model or the BJSMM. We didn't find that there was any reduction in bias, right? Even when those assumptions, um, when, when there truly was a different linkage parameter between um, the first and second stage for each treatment, we didn't see that it actually really helped um, all that much. And so we figure for small samples, you know, this assumption is, is not so terrible to make um, and helps in, in, um, in savings there from estimating more parameters. And then if you're worried about these assumptions that we made in terms of like the linkage parameters being the same and the estimation space for beta naught and beta one, you could certainly do a sensitivity analysis with the um, frequentist joint stage model, which doesn't impose those assumptions. Or you can do a, um, you could use another Bayesian model, which again also doesn't impose those assumptions. And so you can use different prior distributions um, that would allow your estimation to go across, um, you know, to consider any positive number there. So we came out with this design um, and methods. It actually went through a protocol. Um, uh, the protocol of Aramis was revised to use these methods for analysis before it was um, going to use some frequentist methods that ignored some of the data. Um, and then we thought, okay, now if other investigators, right, we want other investigators to think about using these methods, um, how can we help them? Well, we can try to develop some um, sample size calculations. So our goal was to find the sample size such that the credible interval of the difference between the two best treatments would rule out zero with some desired power. Now, right, it's not always clear how you want to think about sample size in a setting of three treatments. Um, this is what we thought would be um, likely, uh, likely desired from a trial like this. Um, so we'd compare the treatment with the highest posterior mean versus the treatment with the second post highest posterior mean. And again, we're assuming this SN Smart design with three active treatments. Um, and that there's one unique best treatment. So we developed some methods um, and we put those all in the back end of an R Shiny app. This is available via my website, um, also the University of Michigan website. We have an area for software developed by all of our faculty and students. Um, and it has a nice little description and design map and then asks for input parameters and tries to give some guidance as to what those actually mean. So we're asking for what are the three expected response rates. Um, and then we ask for means for the prior distributions for our linkage parameters. And we give some um, guidance that this is beta one is the linkage parameter for the first stage responders. And we say this likely is gonna range between one and one over the largest response rate. Um, and that it's, you know, giving, it's letting us know the response rate in the second stage um, for those, responder, those responders to treatment K. Um, and then beta naught, again, the linkage parameter for the not first stage non-responders. And based on our assumptions, that would most likely range from zero to one. And so we're looking for some means of those. 
Um, then we also ask for the coverage rate, which we can, you know, most people, if they're coming from a frequentist background, are going to think of in terms of the type one error. And then we're essentially asking for the power, um, which is the probability to identify the best treatment. So you can put that information into our sample size applet. It takes anywhere from instantaneous to a few minutes to give you a response. It is doing a bit of a grid search. So most often it takes about a minute or two and then out will pop a uh, sample size. So I'm not showing you again, all of the results. This has also been published, but um, our, if you consider three scenarios here um, where we're interested in a coverage rate of 90% and a power, uh, of a power of 80%. Um, if we have these scenarios where we think treatment effects might be 25% versus 50% or 20% versus 40 or 30 and 50, you can see the different sample size per arm. So these are per arm, you need three times that for our SN smart design. And you can see that our estimate gives about the nominal power. Um, and the next best method to estimate the sample size for an SN smart was given by our colleague Roy Tamura in a 2016 paper, which again was frequentist and ignored some of the data. And so we see that there's at least 30% sample size savings compared to that, that method. Okay, so building upon that, um, you know, there's been, a, like I said, a fair amount of literature of including adaptive components into um, clinical trial design for rare diseases. And we thought in this case, especially if you're gonna have three active treatments, it really would make a lot of sense to have some interim analyses built in and to allow for early dropping of a treatment arm if it's not looking um, uh, like it's going to be successful. So we developed um, group sequential design for SN Smart via a two-step Bayesian dropping rule and so essentially um, we suggest that there can be at most two looks. Um, and at that look, you'd use our Bayesian joint stage model. You'd obtain the posterior draws of the response rate for each treatment. And then you can decide via these two steps is one treatment definitely, you know, is one treatment looking better than the other two? Um, then you could drop one of the other two arms or is one treatment looking clearly much worse than the other two then drop that worst arm. And you know, we have these kind of like uh, tuning parameters involved to get the operating characteristics um, to what you, you know, what you deem um, uh, valid or you know appropriate for for the design um, to figure out if if this is um, something feasible that you'd like to go forward with. So again, not showing you all the scenarios or all. Um, all the intricacy of, of this two-step dropping rule, but just wanting to show you that, you know, we've considered several different scenarios. In this first scenario, um, there's no better treatment. So you can see again, these are um, the, this is a ratio of the counts of the number of patients on each treatment, A, B, and C. Um, we can focus on the black bars here, which is the two-step dropping rule with two potential looks in a trial. Um, the, the other gray bars are if you just have a one-step rule, um, so like only if one of the treatments looks worse, would you drop it and you only look once, um, or if you have two steps in one look. Anyway, if we focus on these black, this is a, these bars are the ratio of the counts of the individuals on an SN smart that includes the group sequential design or allows for these interim looks versus if you just had a standard SN smart that did not include it. Um, the interim looks. And so you would imagine, right, in an all scenario where there's no best treatment or no worst treatment, that the same amount of individuals are going to go on all the um, treatments, regardless of whether you have interim analyses included or not, because you're not going to drop an arm um, most of the time. Now, in this scenario, there's clearly a, a inferior treatment. Treatment A is inferior. And so um, you'll see here that for uh, the two-step dropping rule to, to looks, right? This black bar is um, greater than one for treatments B and C. More individuals are getting on those treatments B and C because treatment A, um, that, that uh, treatment arm is being dropped at some interim look. Um, and then scenarios three and four are just different variations where there are different response rates. And so you can see again that anytime the bars go above this, um, black line at one, more participants are receiving the better performing treatments. 
Um, and so it just allows, right, this might be something for patient recruitment and retention. It might be something um, that uh, we can get more efficient estimates of our best performing treatments. Um, and so that those can, things can help both with the um, recruitment of the trial and also with the statistical properties of the treatment F, uh, estimate for which treatment you go forward with. So we found that fewer patients received, uh, were expected to receive the worst treatment with this group sequential design. We could still get unbiased and efficient estimation of the treatment effects, um, particularly of that best performing treatment. And we can control the overall probability of removing arms by calibrating these cutoffs um, of the posterior probabilities of treatments, assuming that all treatments were equal. So essentially under some sort of like null scenario, we can use these tuning parameters or these calibration parameters to make sure that we're not making poor decisions often. Now, when I, and I introduced the SMART design, I said that they were really motivated by these dynamic treatment regimens, which are sequences of individually tailored decision rules that can specify whether, how, or when to alter the type or dosage or intensity of treatment at critical decision points. So for example, um, a dynamic treatment regimen might be first start with A, and if you respond, continue, and if you don't, switch to B. That's one dynamic treatment regimen. And that's really where SMART designs um, we're motivated from to try to develop these sequences of, of, of treatments because that's often how many chronic and even acute illnesses are treated over time where there could be treatment synergies or treatment antagonisms that we'd wanna capture in a trial. We can still do that here. So I said, you know, take away anything you knew about SMARTs, erase it from your mind. Um, we don't think that an SN SMART would be motivated by finding these tailored sequences of treatments because we know we're really limited in small samples. However, we obviously have the same sort of design. Um, and so therefore we can estimate these dynamic treatment regimen effects um, and, and provide credible intervals around them. We just expect that, right, they're not going to be very efficient estimates because we have such small, small samples. Um, but we can do that with our model. If we're gonna do that, we likely wanna use the, the linkage parameters that depend on the first stage treatment to allow these dynamic treatment regimens to differ a bit more. Um, and so we can loosen that assumption on the Bayesian joint stage model. The linkage parameters are the same. And then we can just use, um, the, our estimates for our response rates and um, the uh, treatment effects, right? Our treatment effects, the PIK and the number of responders and non-responders to figure out what our, our, our estimate of the effect for a dynamic treatment regimen would be. So this would, this dynamic treatment regimen, for example, say that you got, you would get treatment A um, initially, and if you respond continue, and if you don't switch to treatment B, right, this would be pi A, B, um, and we could combine for responders who actually got A, right, the response rate, and um, for the non-responders who got B, their response rate, and come up with the overall response rate for the dynamic treatment regimen. So this would be really considering instead of the six-month response rate, it would be the 12-month response rate or the end of the second stage um, outcome. So all of those methods had really focused on binary outcomes because that's what um, Aramis was using. And so since we were clearly motivated by that setting, we focused a lot of our um, initial methods on binary outcomes. However, we know that there's also a fair amount of literature out there, particularly in small samples saying, you know, you might, you should consider continuous outcomes or they're also just um, disease settings where continuous outcomes would make more sense. So we wanted to figure out how can we extend the design and the methods for continuous outcomes. And in fact, we wanted to even allow the re-randomization to depend on a continuous outcome as opposed to some binary outcome. And so this made it motivated some work which was recently published um, where we've adapted the design so that you know, initially participants can be randomized equally between three treatments. Then we, at the end of stage one, collect some continuous outcome Y1. And instead of having to have some like dichotomization of that or alternate binary outcome that defines response for who's, who's re-randomized and who's not, um, 
you know, it's likely in a small sample or rare disease that we don't have enough pilot data, or we can't get enough pilot data because of the limited number of people to, to figure out what that dichotomization should be. So instead, we can use what we call mapping functions. And um, we can use the function of that continuous outcome to decide which is the second stage treatment that an individual would get randomized to. And if we assume that the higher the continuous outcome, right, the higher the Y1, the better, we'd want more individuals, right, with higher outcomes to probably to stay on that first stage treatment and individuals with lower outcomes to be re-randomized between the other treatments. Um, what's neat about this is that you can include any information you have about your outcome sort of in the development of this mapping function. So we can think of this f of y1 can take many different forms that would likely depend on what we expect the distribution of y to look at, to look like. Um, and so our mapping functions um, can be different um, depending upon what we expect so that we are getting more individuals re-randomized who have poor outcomes um, and more individuals who have good outcomes to continue on their treatment. Um, what we found is that, you know, probably what you'd most likely do if you didn't have enough data to dichotomize that outcome at the end of the first stage to say, oh, response versus non-response, you'd say, well, let's just take the median, right? This will be the, the responders will be those who are above the median, the non-responders will be those who are below the median. And if you use the median um, for a cutoff, as opposed to this mapping function, you'll get these the, the treatment effects will have a huge bias variance trade-off. So generally there's either low bias and super high variance or high bias and low variance. Um, and so it's not ideal um, in small samples to um, try to make a, a response variable if you don't have enough data of what, what that dichotomization cut point should be. Now, if you instead use a mapping function, you actually don't have to have a super great idea of the distribution of the outcome to choose this mapping function. What we found was that regardless of the mapping function, we got really robust results um, across the mapping functions and across it, it all giving similar type um, uh, average patient outcomes at the end um, as well. So that we weren't just, you know, for statistical efficiency, um, reducing the the um, quality of our patients in the trial. So our patient outcomes really remain similar. The mapping, the choice of the mapping uh, function didn't matter too much, um, it's quite flexible um, and is really nice that you can use this without a lot of prior knowledge of the distribution of your outcome. Um, in the more recent past, um, so the last maybe year or two, um, a lot of that previous, all the methods that I presented up until this point was really um, uh, supported by a PCORI, so Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Initiative contract, a method, of improving methods contract. And then we have a FDA contract um, where we're working with the FDA to develop methods for an SN smart design where instead of assuming three active treatments, well, what if now we include placebo into the mix? And you could have two active treatments or we've really been thinking about two dose levels. So in rare diseases, often the dose finding part is skipped um, because we don't have enough treatments to do dose finding and then confirmatory trial. So we're sort of combining the dose finding with the confirmatory trial um, in an SN smart design and allowing for any individual who received placebo to be re-randomized to a dose level, which could really help the recruitment and retention of our patients in this type of trial. And then additionally, getting two stages of data and combining them through joint stage models, allowing for higher efficiency of the treatment effect or dose level estimates. Um, and so we hope that this design will be considered um, in registering a drug and allowing for um, more dose finding. Right now, what happens often is that the highest dose level is just taken forward, but it's possible that a low dose could be just as efficacious and more tolerable. And so we wanna have that ability in small samples while also giving the confirmatory effect of comparing those dose levels versus placebo to just move forward to register the drug. Um, so we, we have a manuscript out with um, binary outcomes and then we've, uh, recently adapted it to continuous outcomes, and we are in the midst of, of publishing that. 
So in conclusion, um, as I said, this was just a really high level overview of the methods we've been working on over the last few years, which have all dealt with a small sample sequential multiple assignment randomized trial or SN smart design. And we've really focused on Bayesian analysis because we feel like this is the most efficient and effective tool to, to also incorporate historical data um, when comparing treatments in small samples for rare diseases. And SN smart might appeal more to patients than say a crossover design because they could be re-randomized to different patients if they're not responding, but stay on their treatment if they are responding. Um, like I said, the protocol was amended for Aramis to use our Bayesian joint stage model for analysis. They're also considering incorporating um, interim look and potentially dropping an arm as accrual has been quite slow um, over the last few years and, or last year. And um, it's pretty neat to be working in on the statistical methods, but to see the actual clinical impact of what we're doing um, as this trial is ongoing. Um, and the more we work in this area, the more we realize there are so many open questions and opportunities, again, in small data that we haven't yet conquered before we um, make our way to that big data. And so um, we're really excited to continue working in, in this space. Um, I have a few of the references I use. These are a list of um, most of the manuscripts that we've produced from our group about SN smart design. Um, and then if you're just generally interested in learning about smart design for um, standard sample sizes, um, actually this, this site has changed. It's now actually hosted by University of Michigan. But if you, if you search for this, I think it'll still take you um, to it. It's a nice intro page about smart design. This paper um, that came out of Susan Murphy's lab in 2012 is an excellent introduction to smart design that's super highly readable by non-statisticians alike. Um, so I like sending that to, to investigators who I work with. Um, and then there are a few books, two of which are, are mentioned here um, that I think are excellent for, for smart design and analyses. Otherwise, I appreciate um, you all coming and listening and I'd be happy to consider any questions. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you very much. Um, any questions in the room or online? I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's a very nice talk, thank you. So I have a question like uh, by definition, by the concept in this talk, I think all those phase two clinical trial in cancer they are small sample size because uh, we, we rarely have uh, more than 200 patients. So uh, do you recommend all those phase two trial using this method or, and also is the number of treatment will affect the usage of this method. So in cancer, we often have a proposed drug and the standard of care. That's most of the time mm -hmm. we deal with the treatment. treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not saying that these should replace like the phase two trial space. I think these uh, these types of designs were really trying to get more out of a limited sample size for which we couldn't move on, right? And get thousands of patients like we can in some of these um, cancer settings. So that's certainly not the case. Um, just sort of saying, you know, how I'm not trying to bypass the standard phasing of trials or what, you know, the FDA would like to see for most treatments, but for those for which we really can't get that sample size, you know, what could we do? So that that's really the setting, what we're looking in. Um, and then, yes, so right, the SN Smart Design, I really focused on considered three active treatments. Um, and then I showed you, you know, what if you use placebo, but you could also certainly think about, you know, what if one is standard of care and then we have two treatments. So we did have a paper, um, that considered that setting as well. And then that might change what your prior distributions are, what, what your true interest is in. Maybe it's not all pairwise treatment, you know, pairwise treatment uh, differences. It's just really the two with the standard of care. Thank you. Yeah. To, to follow up on Ming's question of sort of reducing, what if we think about this in terms of the, the effective sample size within each treatment arm and sort of expanding that beyond three, let's say we're using a bio marker or a genetic uh, variant to then hmm. you know, inform those treatment arms. So you have combinations of biomarker and treatment. And so now you're maybe over, you know, over three arms, let's say, but the sample size 
you know, within each one is small, but there could be crossover in terms of the treatments within those. Is that, because I think that's the benefit is you have this ability to combine across the stages with small sample size within each arm. Yes. Yeah, totally. I think that could definitely be a setting in which this could be useful. Hi, my name is Steven. So I, I have a question though. You know, I, I think we are having like two concepts here. One is um, more of a, a implementation. That means we have multiple treatment and we try to figure out, you know, which one is um, better for an individual. The second is regulatory. Regulatory is from FDA standpoint. You know, if you have a new drug, you want to know, is the new drug better than the traditional mm -hmm. drug? Mm -hmm. So there's a two, two issue here, but when we mix it together, it's kind of confusing. You know, when we try to do this kind of a small design, we figure out, uh, well, we have, we try to maximize the treatment response. And also we try to figure out drug A and drug B, which one is better. If we end up with like 80% of the patient, you know, receive drug A and 20% receive uh, drug B, it doesn't mean, you know, drug A is better than drug B. Maybe drug A is good for the 80% of the patient and the drug B, is better for the 20% of the patient. If we switch the treatment, it may not really you know, benefit to the, you know, the, the other group. So that's a concept for individualized treatment. And, but FDA doesn't really, you know, FDA care about, should I prove this new drug or not? Mm -hmm. uh, what, this new drug is better than the old drug. So this is two different concepts. So I, through my understanding, you know, this design couldn't tease out this. Yeah, so I think right like with the with the initial design that I showed where we have three different treatments we're not registering a drug like those drugs are out there right there they exist we're just trying to provide some clinical evidence for which we'd like to you know then go back with guidelines for the um, clinicians treating the patients right that this right, is better. Right. Yeah, this this type of the other design that we've been working on now that includes placebo this really is considering registering the drug. Um, and, and so showing, you know, which dose is, is better than placebo and how can we go forward, um, with them, but we're not like in any of these, we're not really considering subgroups. The sample sizes are already too small. We can't go in and look, you know, and see, you know, which are, which are the better, which treatments are better for, for even smaller subgroups. Okay. So there's no, like comparison, like one is better than the other. It's all about the combination for, but you see, the, like, for, for, like for this example, how do we know? Yeah, so no, we would compare low, versus, low dose versus placebo and high dose versus placebo, right? Mm -hmm. That's our main, main comparisons of interest. And we move forward, right, with which is, which is most effective or which is like, including the safety as well, right? Maybe if they have a similar mm -hmm. efficacy, but low dose was safer, then we move forward with, we'd go register low dose. Okay. Yeah, it's not a combination or it's not a sequence that we're interested in. Um, it's really the low versus placebo, high versus placebo. Okay, okay, got it. Yep. Any further questions? I'm curious about um, thinking about just the practical aspect of having the re-randomization and um, do you assume in, in your, through your simulation studies and in your modeling that you're not going to have people drop out at that stage? And if you did, would you use some sort of Bayesian imputation or how would you address that or even you know plan ahead for that? Or how would you, what was your intuition tell you? Yeah, so most of what we've been doing, we've been, mainly assuming that there's no dropout. However, um, the Bayesian methods work if there are, right? We can still use the data that we have and get the posterior distributions and effects. Um, we could certainly think about imputation. We haven't, we haven't really addressed missing data thus far, but you're right that this clearly is going to require a longer time period of the trial. And we hope that the ability to receive additional treatment that you're already doing well on or treatment that you're not doing well on would help retain the, the patients, but it is possible that we could lose some. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a great talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Everybody. Bye.